Hey y'all, howdy. Welcome to One for the Books. I'm Sandra Broadwell. This is my birthday week. I'm super excited and I have a bunch of great book recommendations for you guys today. I'm turning 33 and I'm just really jazzed about that. My 30s have been really awesome so far and I am really excited about the year ahead. So yeah, 33 is going to be rad. For my birthday, I wanted to give you guys 33 book recommendations. And I gave myself a couple of requirements for what those books would be. Number one is I didn't want to include any books that I have previously mentioned on my channel. So these are all pre my joining booktube reads. And then the second requirement was that I couldn't include any books that were like required reads back in school because I didn't want to include a bunch of books that most everyone has already read even though a lot of the books I'm going to talk about are probably very popular reads that a lot of people have read. I just wanted to exclude the required reads for myself. And then the third requirement was that I'm not including more than one book by the same author. So 33 unique authors, 33 unique books. All right. So with that all said, happy birthday to me and let's get into the books. <music> So I've got these split off by category and I think my largest category is science fiction. So we'll just dive right into that. My first recommendation is Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. Slaughterhouse Five was my absolute favorite book from like the time I was in high school and like for the next 10 years. I've probably read it like three times. Kurt Vonnegut is a very literary kind of whimsical author and he looks at a lot of really existential topics. He never intended to be a science fiction writer but that was the genre that he was kind of categorized in and I think that always ruffled his feathers a little bit. His humor is very sharp and witty and to the point. He's just always saying deep things that sort of feels like a punch to the face. I really love Kurt Vonnegut. I've read probably 10 or 12 of his books and I've probably liked all but three or four of them. So Slaughterhouse-Five is the one I always come back to because I just feel like the themes are so deep there and this book is about a soldier in World War II named Billy Pilgrim and specifically it is about the bombing of Dresden in Germany which was a really horrific war crime that happened where this entire civilian city was destroyed. Billy Pilgrim was there and experienced that and it's about his experiences and also him experiencing PTSD from that. There's also kind of an alien abduction thing that's happening and you never really know even at the end of the book if the alien abduction was something that happened or if it was just like a sort of a switch that flipped in his brain that because Dresden was so traumatic that he would just like disassociate and like go into this like other place whenever he was not wanting to deal with the reality of the horrors around him. So really, really excellent read and highly recommend. All right, book two is The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. I read this way back in the day. This was probably my first ever classic sci-fi read and I would highly recommend this to people even if they are too intimidated by classic sci-fi. I think a lot of people, when they think of classic sci-fi, they think of like hard science or like really deep themes that are just kind of over their head or something like that. But The Time Machine is super short and it's just a really cool story about the future of planet Earth and what happens when people go forward to basically like the ends of the Earth and what humanity has evolved into and things like that. So that's just a really easy, quick read. It's not super science or anything, but it does does like provoke some deep thoughts, which is fun. Number three is 1984 by George Orwell. This is a classic dystopian science fiction novel. It's about this protagonist named Winston who works for a government institution that basically censors books, if I remember correctly. I have read 1984 more than one time, but it has been probably over a decade since I've read it most recently. It is just so poignant and relevant today, even more so perhaps than when it was first written, I think in like the 1940s. If you're interested in dystopian literature at all, like 1984 is the dystopian book that you should read. It is so, so good. Number four is Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. I've heard not great things about this 
author, but I was obsessed with Ender's Game when I was in middle school. I read the entire Ender's Game series, and then there's a spinoff series called Ender's Shadow, and I read that entire series as well. Those books had such an impact on me and were probably the first science fiction books that I remember reading and helped spark my love for science fiction stories. But I think these are easily read by adults. They're not really middle grade books. They are like coming of age books and they're about young children, but they go through these children's entire lives all the way up through adulthood. So Ender's Game, the original book, is about this boy named Ender who is recruited by this military school. He's super duper smart and they play these war games at this military school as a sort of training for fighting the war against these alien invaders called the Buggers. I don't want to reveal too much about it, but there's a big twist that happens. It's just really, really excellent. The movie that they made about it with Harrison Ford a couple of years ago, I thought was kind of terrible. So if you saw that movie, don't let that color your opinion of the book. Number five is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy will forever be one of my favorite all-time books. If anyone is not interested in science fiction, I still always recommend Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because it is just so hilarious and bizarre and absurd. Douglas Adams is so witty and funny. I would say if you are a fantasy reader and you like Terry Pratchett, you will definitely like Douglas Adams. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a five book series. So it's about this main character named Arthur and he is kind of a mopey main character and he finds out that Earth is about to be destroyed because aliens from a different galaxy are going to destroy Earth in order to pave like an intergalactic highway uh, where Earth is sitting. <laughs> it just has a really bizarre premise from the get-go and the adventures that they get into along the way are so, so fun. I absolutely adore these books. All right, number six is Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. I had a Michael Crichton phase for a while when I was younger and there are multiple Michael Crichton books that I could recommend. But Jurassic Park, I think, is one that doesn't get enough hype because the movies have become such a big deal that I think a lot of people just watch the movie and never actually go and read the source material. First, I absolutely love the original Jurassic Park movie. But despite my love for that, I also love the book and they're not very similar. Obviously, they have the same premise, but the movie kind of took it in its own direction. And that's one of the few instances where I think where the movie and the book weren't that similar, but they're still just like equally awesome. The book has some like really intense scenes. I specifically remember like one scene where they're like in a canoe, like trying to escape from a Tyrannosaurus down the river or something. And the Tyrannosaurus can swim and they thought they were going to be safe in the water and then they're not. And it's like chasing after them in the water. And I was like so gripped <laughs> during so many of those scenes that happened in the book. And I was just like, oh, why wasn't this in the movie? That was so good. So definitely if you're interested, if you've never read a Michael Crichton before, definitely pick up Jurassic Park. It is so awesome. Number seven, no surprise here, Dune by Frank Herbert. This book is very dry and very slow, but holy smokes, like there is absolutely a good reason why this is such a classic. I read it for the first time probably like 10 years ago, and then I reread it, you know, last year or the year before, right before the movie came out, to kind of refresh myself. And I do think they're doing a really good job with the movie, and I can't wait to see part two when that comes out this coming winter. But it is about all of this sort of intergalactic political intrigue. So our main character in Dune is this boy named Paul Atreides. He is the son of a duke and the son of a Bene Gesserit, who's kind of like a well-connected witch. And his family is assigned to take over a leadership of this planet called Arrakis, where all of these spice for the entire galaxy is mined. And spice is this basically drug that allows for intergalactic travel. And when they arrive on this planet, there's this former family that was in charge of the planet called the Harkonnens. They're very angry about losing this power over the planet. There's a lot of tension between these two families, but there's also these indigenous people that live on Arrakis. They're trying to figure out how to balance all 
these political machinations while also like learning from the indigenous people and not just colonizing them. The book obviously goes to so many more depths than the movie can, but it is it is such an excellent, excellent book. I have not read any of the Dune sequels. I've heard because I think, you know, there's like 12 of them maybe. And I've heard after like book three or four or six or whatever, like at some point in the series, everyone pretty much agrees that it just gets really, really weird. But I have heard that it is worth continuing at least for, you know, the first several books after the first one. So I intend to do that at some point. But yeah, highly recommend Dune by Frank Herbert. Book number eight is Ready Player One by Ernest Cline. This book had a big heyday several years ago. And this is like the ultimate popcorn read. If you are in a reading slump and you just want something fast and quippy to get you back into reading, I highly recommend Ready Player One. It is about a boy that in a future reality where Earth is kind of trash and everyone pretty much lives entirely within their like virtual reality worlds because it's so much better than the actual reality of Earth. And there is like some sort of contest that happens where this person has like hidden some great treasure within this game. It's based in a lot of like 80s throwback pop culture references and things like that. And I didn't understand most of those and that didn't take away from my enjoyment from it whatsoever because that was before my time, but that didn't really matter. And I thought that it was really well plotted and fast paced and it was just super fun from start to finish. I couldn't put it down. Number nine, a book that came out around the same time, I think, is The Martian by Andy Weir. It is about a researcher, astronaut person on Mars and this giant dust storm blows up and separates him from his crew and he nearly dies and his crew thinks that he has died and because of the impact of the storm they have to leave the planet and so he basically becomes the only human on earth and he has no way to contact his crew and let them know that he's still alive and so it's a story of survival on the red planet and the main character is super witty and funny and again this was a fast read. It has a lot of scientific jargon in it, but it's not really necessary for you to be able to absorb any of that to enjoy the story. Number 10 is Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. This one was a surprise for me because I found this book as like a trade paperback in my parents' basement when I was in high school. And I didn't think I would like it, honestly, because it's so old. Like Jules Verne is pretty much the OG science fiction author with like Mary Shelley and H.G. Wells. And I just didn't think a book this old would be good. But it was honestly like pretty awesome. It was really, really interesting. And it is about this guy that is like trekking through Iceland and he finds a cave in a mountain in Iceland that leads to the center of the earth. Obviously not very realistic uh, because we know that, you know, the mantle is full of magma and stuff like that and the crust is not very deep, but still a super fascinating read. I think they've made several Journey to the Center of the Earth movies over the years and don't, <laughs> don't even look at them. They're so far off of what the actual story was about and what it gets into, but the book itself was a really, really fascinating story and I I definitely loved it at the time that I read it. All right, number 11 is my last sci-fi of this video, and that is going to be The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury, he's a very famous kind of classic sci-fi author, also wrote Fahrenheit 451 and a bunch of others. I think The Martian Chronicles I read when I was in middle school and just have continued thinking about that story literally ever since then. It is about humans that colonize Mars and what happens to them and what they find there. It's a very short story. It might actually technically be a short story or a novella. I can't remember how long it is, but it was very, very short. So that's a really easy one if you're looking for just like a quick sci-fi win. My next category is going to be fantasy recommendations. So book number 12 is American Gods by Neil Gaiman. I had a Neil Gaiman phase for a while. I read a bunch of his stuff. And so there's quite a few different Neil Gaiman books that I would recommend and some that I would not recommend. But the one that I'm going to recommend for this video is American Gods. I haven't seen the recent show that they made about that. I heard good things about it. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. The concept behind American Gods is that people's beliefs basically create godlike entities. And so every god that you've ever heard of, like all of the Norse gods and the Egyptian gods and Greek gods, all of those entities actually existed because people believed they existed. But these days people believe in things like capitalism. And so like that's a god too. And so American Gods is really about like this mortal guy named Shadow, I think, and he gets wrapped up in this kind of war between the old gods and the new. 
if that doesn't sound intriguing to you, I mean, come on. Book number 13 is Kashiel's Dart by Jacqueline Carey. This is a high fantasy series, is so good. And when I talk about this book, I'm really talking about the series as a whole. The Kashiel's Dart trilogy is like the first three books. And then there's like a second trilogy that includes all the same characters from the first trilogy, but focuses on a different main character. And then I think there's also like a third trilogy that's set like a hundred years in the future. I have not read the third trilogy, but I have read the first six books, the first two trilogies in the series. And they were all six of those books were so good. I will say Kashiel's Dart is probably the worst of all six of those books from my first experience on the read through just because it's so heavy on the world building that it has a fairly slow start. But once you get to like the midpoint of Kishiel's Dart, like everything is just so good. This is, I think, political intrigue at its finest. So the main character of the series of this first trilogy is a woman named Phaedra, and their entire society has a very interesting relationship to sex. So sex workers and escorts are very, like, highly regarded, revered people in society. And Phaedra is raised from a very young age to be this sex worker. She is a chosen from the god Kashiel. Kashiel is not only raised to be like a very particular type of prostitute, but also she is raised to be somewhat of a spy. And so she is an escort for all these important people up in society. And there's just, there's so much intrigue and backstabbing and machinations that happen. If you love court intrigue, like there is no better series than this one. And there's also like a healthy amount of really good steamy smut. So there is some romance in the book, but I don't consider it a romance really series. I consider it definitely just like a high fantasy epic. There's so much cool stuff that happens and the characters are just unforgettable. All right, number 14 is Good Omens by Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. So I know I said I wasn't gonna use the same author twice, and I already said Neil Gaiman, but it's also written by Terry Pratchett and I haven't recommended a book by him yet. Good Omens is just excellent. It's the same type of humor as Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but it is about the apocalypse. It is about basically an angel and a demon who are supposed to help bring about the apocalypse, but they actually kind of like humans and don't want the world to end. And so it's just about their dynamic and what happens in the world leading up to the apocalypse. And there's just so much humor in it. It's really just delightful. Number 15 is going to be The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. If you have tried to read the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship specifically, and DNF'd it because you were like, this is too slow and boring for me. I still recommend you try The Hobbit because that's me. I've tried to read The Lord of the Rings several times and I've never been able to get through it because it's just such a slog. But I still read The Hobbit and really enjoyed it. So if you're in that same boat, pick up The Hobbit. It's a much more well-paced book and the story is delightful. I'm sure we all know what the story is, so I won't get into it, but The Hobbit is a great book. Number 16 is Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. This is not really fantasy so much as magical realism. It starts off with an ad in the paper of a philosophy teacher seeking a serious student and the man that goes to answer this ad is the main character of the story. I really don't want to reveal anything about it, but if you are interested in philosophy or if you like books that have philosophical themes, I don't think there is a better one out there than this one. Ishmael is just incredibly deep, but incredibly accessible, and it's a little bizarre because of the magical realism element to it. And I just think this is like the perfect book for any college freshman. I think it should be one of those like required reading books for everyone entering that phase of their life. I would give this book to any person of that age. That's all I'm gonna say. Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. Number 17 is The Golden Compass by Philip Pullman. And really I'm recommending the entire His Dark Materials trilogy. I know I've mentioned the show His Dark Materials on my channel before, but I haven't actually talked about the books. And so I do wanna give a shout out to that series right now. His Dark Materials is so good. It is about this kind of alternate reality where people's souls are embodied in kind of animal companions or like familiars that accompany them 
them at all times. These embodiments uh, are called demons. The demons can kind of shapeshift and take on lots of different forms when the people of this world are children, but then once they hit puberty, their demon settles and takes on its final form, which will, it will have for the rest of its life, and so it could be any type of animal. The story here is our main character is a young girl named Lyra, and so because the main character is so young, I think a lot of people think this is a middle grade series, and it is not. I mean, I think it could be read by someone who's middle grade age. It could be read as an adult series. I, I think this is one of those weird kind of genre bending, or at least age category bending book series. But Lyra is this young girl who was raised at Oxford University, and she has a very unique relationship with her parents. She learns over time that she has kind of an ability that no one else has, or that very few other people have. This, the plot kind of starts off with Lyra is concerned because there's this group called Gobblers that are stealing children. Uh, she learns that her uncle Asriel is trying to build a bridge to a parallel universe. So there's so much that happens in the series. I really can't describe it in just a single plot summation, but I don't want to give anything away. So this gets really deep. The characters are so cool, and I really felt very deeply for them. And the HBO series that they made off of this show just wrapped up in December, I think, and was a very good adaptation of it as well. That's the end of my fantasy, so I'm going to dive into two kind of classics literary fiction-esque books. Number 18 will be The Stranger by Albert Camus. This is a pretty short read. It's kind of existential, philosophical. It is about a man who who murders someone and just him dealing with that. There's really not a ton of plot in this book. It is very much more like introspective than plot based, but despite that, I was really impacted by this when I read it in high school. All right, number 19 is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. Again, very much like The Stranger. This is a very kind of existential, kind of feminist, kind of philosophical book. Uh, it is about a very depressed woman. It's pretty much depressed woman vibes. I don't really know what else to say, but again, this had a huge impact on me when I read it. I do think it has a bit of problematic racism in it, um, so just keep that in mind when you go into it. It was written back in the day, and that's unfortunate, but I still think it's a very worthy read. Okay, my next big category is nonfiction. So book number 20 is The Botany of Desire by Michael Pollan. You may have heard of Michael Pollan. He has several big hits over the years. He mostly writes about plants or nature type themes. And The Botany of Desire was a book that had a huge impact on me. I read it my freshman year of college. It's split into four parts. Each part is about a specific plant and how humans have shaped that plant's evolution and also how that plant has shaped human culture. And so the four plants that this book takes a look at are apples, tulips, potatoes, and marijuana. So if that sounds interesting to you, I just really, really enjoyed this book and thought it was super fascinating and again, still think about it quite a bit. Number 21 is Don't Think of an Elephant by George Lakoff. This is a political book. It's very short, again, maybe like 80 pages long. Um, you could easily read it in one sit down. If you are part of the American political system, I think you will find this very fascinating. It is about the liberal conservative thought processes and why certain beliefs belong to certain categories. Like why does someone who is small government also anti-abortion? And why is someone who is usually environmentalist also think, you know, these other things. And so it really, in very clear, concise language, explains the different mindsets that people have that lead to these beliefs and why those beliefs divide into two parties. This is really helpful for me. It just frames things, I think, really clearly and throws into pretty stark relief why people think the things that they do and how trying to talk to them about the thing that you think usually doesn't work because our frames of reference are just so different from each other. All right, book number 22 is Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. This is a book about psychology and behavioral economics and about how companies are trying to manipulate you into buying their products and kind of the language and tactics that marketing firms can use to nudge you to do the things that they want you to do. Super fascinating. Lots of great real life examples that they use in the book to demonstrate these points. I just felt like 
like I learned a lot when I read it. Number 23 is a memoir, and that is going to be Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah, former host of The Daily Show and a comedian, he was born and raised in South Africa, and at the time that he was a child, apartheid was still very much a thing, and he has a black mother and a white father, and so the title of the book Born a Crime is because it was actually illegal to be a mixed race person in South Africa. And so he literally was, his very existence was a crime. And it's about him growing up there during those times and the different cultures and languages. Um, he speaks like quite a few. He's a very, very intelligent person and he speaks multiple different languages based in South Africa and just about his experience growing up there and the hardships that him and his mother faced and all these different things that he went through. It is one of the most impactful memoirs that I have ever read and I would highly recommend it to literally anyone. I learned so much and I have so much more respect for Trevor Noah as a person and everything that he had to get through to be the person that he is today. So such a good read. Book number 24 is the only other memoir that I have and the only book that I have in person with me today and that is Amazon Woman by Darcy Gector. So I've actually met Darcy before. She is a very very cool lady. She owns a company in Ecuador called Small World Adventures and she is a whitewater kayaker and Small World Adventures is a whitewater kayaking like tourist guiding company but she is the first woman who ever paddled from the source of the Amazon all the way to the sea which is I believe the longest largest River. So yeah, this I should just read the subtitle. Facing fears, chasing dreams, and a quest to kayak the world's largest river from source to sea. So she did this along with two of her companions. One of them was like her romantic partner, and one of them was just this guy that they knew that they had taken on some adventures before, who was like a customer of theirs, and he basically paid them to be his guide as he did this expedition. I don't think she'd ever done a big expedition like this before this book. There was a lot of things that they had to go through. There were things like dams and cultural and language barriers and lots of just like challenges that they faced, including like group dynamics that were really taxing <laughs> on her mental health uh, along the way. She ends up like cutting her hair because she's afraid of being a woman in some of these areas that they go through. And overall, this was a super riveting read. There's only a short section of the Amazon that I think was actual whitewater and I had some pretty harrowing experiences through that section, which were really riveting to read. I just love this book. I read it in like a day and a half and highly recommend it. If you're looking for a good adventure read. Number 25 is Common Sense by Thomas Paine. This is a classic early American political read. It was written before I think America gained its independence. And so it was like a pamphlet that was put out to convince British occupied Americans that they were deserving of independence and being a free nation. And I just was really really impressed by this little booklet and what it had to say about the nature of freedom and independence and political workings and things like that. So it's a very short read and I think should be required by more schools. Book number 26. This one's kind of old, but this is called Four Fish by Paul Greenberg. The subtitle is The Future of the Last Wild Food. It has kind of the same setup as The Botany of Desire, where instead of choosing four different plants, it talks about four different fish and human impact on these fish ecosystems and how they're caught and raised today to meet human needs and how that's changed kind of everything about ecosystems and the ocean and the rivers that these fish inhabit. So super impactful read for me at the time definitely changed the way I thought about eating fish or seafood. I'm sure some of the info is out of date. I think this came out probably in like 2014 or something, but still I think probably very impactful to anyone who reads it. Okay, I have one thriller to recommend and that is A Time to Kill by John Grisham. I again probably read this in middle school. A Time to Kill is about a young black girl that is sexually assaulted by an adult white man and then her father kills that man and then it is about the trial of the father in like 1960s segregated South. It's very good. It's very heart-wrenching. It's very fast-paced. And it also has a great movie adaptation from like the 90s or whenever that 
had like every A-list actor at the time. It was like Donald and Kiefer Sutherland and Matthew McConaughey and Sandra Bullock and Samuel L. Jackson. So the movie was also really good. Yeah, I just remember, I don't know how that book would stand up in my mind today, but at the time that I read it, I was really wowed by the story. And I went on a huge John Grisham kick after that back in my middle school years. Definitely was a little advanced for me at the time, but was a great read. Okay, then I have three historical fiction recommendations. Water for Elephants by Sarah Gruen is kind of a historical romance. It's about a circus and this young man that joins up with the circus and falls in love with like the elephant trainer. It has a lot of different things that happen. It's very sad, but it was very good. Number 29 is The Kite Runner by Khaled Hosseini. This is set, I think, in like 1960s Afghanistan and is about a young boy who witnesses something very traumatic when he is a young boy in Afghanistan and then he moves away and then he comes back to Afghanistan as an adult, still dealing with kind of the ramifications of what he saw and how he reacted at the time of that event. So very heart-wrenching, again, very dramatic, very impactful read. It definitely is something that I still think about, even though I read it back when it came out. All right, we're almost there. Book number 30 is The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. I think this is considered young adult, but it is a World War II story about a young girl who loves to read and also has a point of view that is the perspective of death. So if you like a personified death type of story, this is a really, really great read. Okay, one poetry recommendation that I have is that I was obsessed with Billy Collins when I was in high school. Billy Collins was the National Poet Laureate of the United States, and he has a ton of great collections of poetry. I specifically recommend Picnic Lightning, which is one of his collections because it has my favorite poem by him in it. But if you're looking for some poetry and want to try one out. Anything by Billy Collins, but Picnic Lightning specifically. All right, number 33, I have a horror recommendation and that is Edgar Allan Poe. I'm sure, you know, I remember in high school I was required to read, I think, The Telltale Heart and The Fall of the House of Usher, but diving into some of Edgar Allan Poe's lesser known works is just as interesting. And so I recommend The Pit and the Pendulum. If you liked Edgar Allan Poe, or if for some reason you've never read any Edgar Allan Poe, Pit and the Pendulum is very short just like everything that Edgar Allan Poe is famous for. Really, you know, that kind of psychological horror similar to The Telltale Heart. It's just a easy, quick, gothic, nightmarish type story. And I really love his dark vibes. All right, we made it. The very last recommendation, number 33, is I'm just going to recommend a collection of Calvin and Hobbes by Bill Watterson. I think you could probably pick up any collection of Calvin and Hobbes. I had like 12 different collections of Calvin and Hobbes comics when I was a kid and I recently gifted them all to my niece because she was 11 at the time and I thought that was the great age to pick them up, but they are 100% for anyone and everyone at any age. Calvin and Hobbes is just delightful. The essential Calvin and Hobbes is the one that I'll recommend for this video, but literally any of them are great. I adore Hobbes. Calvin makes me laugh. And yeah, what a great way to treat yourself is just to like sit down with a nice beverage and a comfy chair and read some Calvin and Hobbes. That's all of my book recommendations for you guys. 33 was a lot. I probably won't do this again for my 34th birthday, but I hope you guys got a good book recommendation out of this. And please like this video if you enjoyed this content and be sure to subscribe for more bookish content to come in the future.